Good afternoon. Welcome to the Tennessee Williams Festival for the 33rd year. And this event, World Editions, presents Saskia de Coster, Annalise Verbecke, and Christian Hammerett. The um, I want you to remind you to turn off your cell phones. And uh, thanks to our sponsor, World Editions, for hosting this event. You can find copies of many of the books available at the book fair next door. And I'm sorry, Katie. Take it away, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so today I am truly delighted to introduce to you three brilliant Belgian writers. Um, we have been sent a gift from the translation gods. Um, so to introduce them to you a little bit more in depth, uh, Saskia de Koster is an author as well as a visual artist, playwright, and regular participant in television debates. She has seven novels to her credit, five of which are currently translated. Her bestseller, We and Me, won the Cutting Edge Award, an award de Koster has won three times, and the Opse Literature Prize, and was nominated for several other prestigious prizes. Her work has been translated into 10 languages. Um, and We and Me uh, is a deep dive into a single family, father, mother, daughter, whose isolation and stumbling attempts at connection are traced over the course of 30 years. Christine Hemmerich's extensive output includes more than 20 novels and numerous collections of short stories and autobiographical essays, a body of work that has frequently been praised by critics and awarded prizes. Never one to shy away from controversy, Hemerex is known for her forthright opinions on social issues. She used to teach English literature at University College Brussels and now teaches creative writing at University College Louvain and the Drama School of Antwerp. She has been awarded the Flemish State Prize and the Franz Kellendonk Prize. And finally, Annelies Verbecke is a writer of novels, short stories, and plays. She made her literary debut in 2003 with the much lauded novel Slop, which sold over 75,000 copies and was published in 22 countries. Verbecke's books have received numerous awards and nominations. 30 Days was chosen as Best Dutch Novel of 2015 by readers of a leading Dutch newspaper, awarded the F. Bordeweg Award and Opse Literature Prize for Best Novel, and nominated for the ECI Literature Prize. Um, oh, I forgot to summarize Christine's book. Uh, the Woman Who Fed the Dogs is a dark and hypnotic examination. This is with a cover. The, the nicer cover. Um, a dark and hypnotic examination of the mind of a real-life woman who is convicted as an accomplice to her husband, a murderer and child abductor. Uh, and Annalise's book, 30 Days, follows a Senegalese migrant named Alphonse, whose handyman profession takes him into the private lives, both funny and poignant, of a very insular community. Um, so I want to start by having them each read just a, a short excerpt of their work uh, so that you can get a taste of their style. All at the same time. Hello. Simultaneously, <laughs> please. <laughs> Three, two, one, start. <laughs> How long do you I, I feel like asking a question to the audience. Have you ever m before met a live Belgian author? Oh, uh, no, okay. And if this was a, que a quiz question apart from us, could you name a Belgian author? No, okay. So we have an incredible responsibility. It's, it's up to us to convince you of the worth of Belgian writers. Okay. Shall I maybe start? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so um, th this novel is, is very much based on, on something that actually happened. The main character is an accomplice, as you said, of a child murderer and rapist. Um, she herself considers herself to be innocent. She sees herself as a victim of this extremely cruel person. But the outside world thinks differently and sees her as an accomplice. And she was also sentenced to 32 years in prison. 
But uh, because she was such a model prisoner, after 16 years, she was released um, on conditions. And uh, the monologue that I wrote is sort of set at a point um, months before she's actually going to be released. And she's aware of the fact that she's going to be released. And so I tried to imagine what on earth could go on in her mind at that stage in her life. And while I did the research, we were talking about research earlier on, uh, I found that she actually was more or less the girl next door, that we grew up in the same neighborhood. And uh, in a way, also when I looked at pictures of her taken when she was in school, she was extremely familiar to me. I said, oh yes, you know, I recognize that kind of person. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's very similar to her, but then in many ways turned out to be very dissimilar. Right. <clears throat> My mother always went to the same hairdresser because the hairdresser knew her hair better than she did herself. She can tell from my hair how I'm feeling. And if she wasn't feeling well, the hairdresser knew which product to treat my mother's hair with to revive it. That hairdresser had a knack. Look, my mother sometimes said, my ends are splitting. It was her way of saying she wasn't feeling well. When she had been to the hairdressers, she usually felt a bit better. She had a loyalty card. Once she had 10 shampoo and sets on her card, she got the 11th for half price. She had loyalty cards for all her favorite shops, so that after 10 or 15 or 20 purchases, she got 5, 6 or sometimes even 10% off. She was given samples in all those shops because she was such a loyal customer. She didn't even have to ask for them. The assistants rummaged in the basket or tray and beamed as they put a handful of samples on top of my mother's purchases for you to try out. The newest products in our range. She was welcomed everywhere as she bought and bought to fill her cards as soon as possible. Isn't she growing? To my mother about me, Miss Michelle Martin, not me. <laughs> I expect she's too big for a sweetie now, to my mother, about me. How lucky she came out unscathed, the pharmacist in a whisper to my mother when she went to collect her supply of tranquilizers, on prescription, of course, always on prescription and always from the same doctor, as that doctor knew how difficult things were for my mother, the grief-stricken widow. And he also knew how she was devoting herself day and night to her daughter, the semi-orphan. So the father died in a car crash, right? Say thank you, I did. Did you say thank you? I didn't hear. If you mumble, people can't hear. The pharmacist had a sweet for me too, or an Easter egg, and said I was getting such a big girl. My mother was very lucky to have such a strapping daughter. It was lovely to see mother and daughter together, inseparable. Once after much pestering, she had allowed me to go to a sports camp with my cousin. My aunt had rung her and told her she was making herself ridiculous by forbidding me to go. Are you going to tire to you all your life? She had asked. My mother had been furious with her sister. Where the hell did her sister get the idea that she was tying me to her? Did she tie me to her when I went to school? Did she tie me to her when I went skating with my cousin at that? That proved her sister was acting in bad faith. No one was in better position than my aunt to know that my mother allowed me plenty of freedom. If she had her doubts about that camp, it was out of concern for me. Could I cope with being away from home for so long? She knew me better than I knew myself. She knew how I was inclined to overestimate myself. You need me, Odette. Go to that camp and we'll see which of the two of us misses the other first and the most. She put her signature on the enrollment form, which apart from that was completely filled out, wrote a check, slipped them both into an envelope, stuck a stamp on it, and without me went to post the letter. I ran after her. I was suddenly terrified that she would throw herself under a car. She pretended not to see me. I couldn't go back home as I didn't have a latch key. I followed her like a dog. She ignored me, but I saw her put the letter in the postbox. 
and I was happy, so happy. Two weeks before I was due to leave, she started pulling her hair out, literally. She, uh, she showed me the tufts. She maintained it was falling out, but it wasn't. She was pulling it out. She called me the most ungrateful child in the world. How could I leave her alone for ten days? Was that what she had sacrifici sacrificed herself for, for day and night? I acted as if I was deaf. I put aside the things I was going to take and phoned my cousin every day. Her father, my uncle, was to take us to the camp and they would provide an extra sheet sleeping bag for me as I didn't have one and didn't know how or where to buy one. I was determined not to give up. The night before the camp, my mother cried so bitterly and she used my father's last handkerchief to wipe away her tears. That handkerchief lay on the cabinet in front of his photo. She had never used it before. It was as if she was saying, look, I am already dead. I'm drying my tears with a handkerchief of death. I couldn't leave her alone. I was frightened she would hang or, hang or gas herself. I did not want to come home to an empty house or to a house where my mother was dangling from the chandelier or lying in the bath with her wrist, with her wrist slashed. She had said so often that she wanted to be with my father. She stayed alive for me. I didn't want to drive her to her death. First, she flung her arms around me, but less than an hour later, she started blaming me for throwing money down the drain. I must learn to be consistent. That was when I was afraid I was going mad. She was driving me mad. In order to free or free in order to be free of her nagging, I paid back my enrollment fee out of my own savings. She tore up the notes in front of me. Halfway through the camp, she decided she wanted to visit my cousin, and I had to go with her. That really was the last straw. I took a volume of hers, as I was afraid I wouldn't be able to control myself if she told people there that we were inseparable so inseparable that I had decided to stay with her at the last minute, since Odette can't do without me. On the way home, she said that my cousin was starting to look common. Did you see her cleavage? If you ask me, that camp is a pretext for looking for a man. Sport doesn't interest her. Behind her back, I popped a second volume in my mouth. My cousin had refused to say a word to me. She wouldn't even look at me. From that day on, I regularly stole pills from my mother. She must have known. There was no way she didn't notice. <laughs> Not all Belgians family, Belgian families are like that, by the way. Well, uh, so for a change, I'll read something from another... Belgian family, uh, from my novel, We and Me. It is, a fact, uh, it is a family novel, so it spans three generations um, of people, first uh, farmers, and then generation of the baby boomers who just had a lot of ambition and um, also the opportunities to make it in life. So this uh, family, there is uh, Stefan, he's the farmer's son who um, achieved quite something, has a nice career, uh, villa, and a wife, she's called Mieke, um, and she stays at home, of course, because that's the way it has to be. She takes care of the house, he takes care of the career, the money, and so they can have a good life. And they have uh, one daughter, Sarah, and in this excerpt, she's uh, a teenager. And Mika, she's a very uh, dedicated housewife, maybe a little bit too dedicated to her job, because she's very nervous all the time. And now she's expecting uh, Elvira, a longtime friend from her childhood, uh, to come and visit. So everything has to be even more clean than it usually is. So it's, she's nervous. The house is Mika's domain. The hobby shed and the chickens are and the chickens are Stefan's. She keeps her house up in her own way, preferably with as little interference as possible. 
Mika spends the next hour working up a storm behind the closed doors of the kitchen and the living room. Sarah is in her room practicing new guitar chords. The gnarled chords play havoc on Mika's nerves, as if someone were sounding an alarm in code. Fortunately, she has a vacuum cleaner to drown out the ghastly music. On she works, polishing feverishly, as if she were trying to keep ahead of Elvira, who could walk in on her any minute with a big telescope to observe the secret preparations. Stefan! She shouts an hour later, running out with a rat face. Stefan, we've been burled. No. They took the cake server. Boy, you really scared me. But they stole the cake server. Well, that's impossible. Well, it's true. The cake server is always in the same place. You know I'm very consistent about that. Sarah doesn't have the cake server either. I've already asked her. Theft? is the only other logical explanation. Mika begins formulating a profile of the perpetrator. A very special kind of thief has broken in. A thief who isn't interested in the safe in the office cabinet hidden behind a whole bunch of binders, who also doesn't care about the expensive Art Nouveau Horta vases or about all of Mika's 24 karat jewelry, but a thief who is interested in only one thing, a cake server. <laughs> well, that cake, silver cake server is an heirloom for my father's mother's mother. Of course thieves would be interested in it, Mika says. The thief went about his work so artfully that he managed to outwit the high-tech alarm system. It's a balanced alarm system with 15 all-seeing eyes mounted at crucial locations near entrances, garage doors, and windows that register the least bit of movement, such as the eyelash of a passing bat, or a human being who unsuspectingly gets out of bed to go to the kitchen for a glass of water. Immediately, faster than the speed of sound, the alarm goes off at the Securitas Surveillance Company and the police station. Within a millisecond, both the police and Securitas are at your front door. In the meantime, the alarm system is lowing like five million cows whose udders are being kicked. Her husband and Sarah are mobilized to search for fingerprints and footprints belonging to the thief, who presumably was so clever that he struck during the day thereby sidestepping their ingenious alarm system. She prods her lethargic husband to call the police. His attempt to calm her down just adds fuel to her fire. After increasingly impassioned counter-arguments from Mika, that of the household shambles reluctantly to the phone in the hope that Sarah, his offspring, will hasten to help him by uttering the liberating cry that the cake server has turned up. Just when Stefan has explained the situation to the police in the most shrouded terms as a possible break-in, and they have said that they aren't going to come out for a missing cake server, and they wouldn't even do it for the queen, and after Mika has wondered out loud, so loud that they can hear it on the other end of the line via Stefan, why in God's name the people on the mountain who pay handfuls of tax money, given the fact that the government services re refuse to help people, at that very moment, Sarah calls out from the cabinet where the cake plates are kept. Found it. <laughs> okay, and then I am going to read from 30 days. I'll read to... Um, passages, and I'll start with the beginning. <clears throat> he drives through the hot, clear weather, through a landscape that remains foreign to him, but that he's hesitantly starting to love. Sometimes he still misses the city, the colors, the sounds, the distractions. Here it's different, not worse. The blossom and buzz of spring turned into a promising summer that fled an excess of rain before coming back to confound the approaching autumn. The fields are still sodden, as if not growing dull and blotchy, the crowns of the trees not with restrained bravura at the sky incessantly bring it on. 
hop boats, bare fat bubbles, drunk on themselves, ready for harvest. Lonely dust whips up and catches in puddles. Roundabout art plums the depths. He's not sure whether all of this strengthens or stupefies him. In a village shared by France and Belgium, he sees two men with flat caps and baskets of pigeons, perhaps. Apart from that, many ponies and a farmer, his glistening tractors circled by seagulls. The other people are hard to see. They're behind front walls or, like him, in cars between front walls. Today he's expected in a nice neighborhood. In this region, the houses are fewer than in the other scraps and patches that make up this small country. With its liking for red brick, it keeps things simple. Just the occasional Spanish hacienda among the mock farmhouses. He's yet to spot any pagodas from the Brussels periphery. The cacophony of building styles, so frequently written off as tasteless, has always cheerily endeared him the way the houses stand next to each other like 12-year-olds on their first day at high school, thrown by pure chance into lo long-term togetherness, adrift in their desperation. It pleases him to see the two modern houses where he parks his van leap out of the monotony. He lifts the top of sponges, cloths, rollers and brushes out of the back of the van and selects one of the pots of paint he's put ready. Picnic from the Joie de Vivre collection for the largest of the kitchen walls. His suggestion, their approval. And then we meet, uh, so this is my main character, Alphonse, driving through the West Hook, which is a remote area in Belgium. Uh, not remote like, it can be remote in huge countries like America, but still we do have some remote parts. And uh, he paints the walls of houses, and when he gets into people's houses in their well, um, ordinary environments, he gets to hear it all, all the, the secrets and problems, and sometimes he hears contradictory stories coming in different households. And, uh, and I think this book has got a lot of tone, so I'm now reading the part um, where uh, it's quite clear that uh, both neighboring couples where he has to go are not getting along that well. Between him and the couple, bubbles tinkle in the glass of tonic they've put on the coffee table for him. At his feet pants a small, attentive dog of an indeterminate breed. When Alphonse picks up the glass and puts it to his mouth, the animal seems to hold its breath. Where are you from? The woman wants to know. From Brussels, he says. I've been living here for almost nine months now. Yes, yes, the woman enunciates, but where are you really from? From Brussels, he said, didn't he? Her husband stands up nervously. Would you like an olive, mister? Some cheese? No, thank you, and just call me Alphonse. We are Sigrinde and Ronnie. I'll go and get some anyway, said the woman after her husband has sat down again. She goes to the kitchen, which is walled off from the living room. It sounds as if she's emptying all the cupboards. How did you get on next door? The man asks. He's obviously trying to make the question sound neutral. I think I'll be finished there by tomorrow evening. Didn't she say anything else when she heard you were also coming to see us? Sigrinde lays down out little bowls of olives and cheese, putting cocktail sticks and a napkin holder beside them. Alphonse isn't immediately sure how to answer. It seemed to interest them, he says. Ronnie sniffs. No doubt, exclaims Sigrinde. She's crazy, Alfredo. They're more forthright than he was expecting. Alphonse, Ronnie corrects her before he can. Sorry. For years, she's been telling anyone who listened that we are copying them. We could say the same thing about them, but we don't, because we're still in command of our faculties. It all came out one evening at a party, Ronnie goes on. A party right here in our house, actually. They were our guests. First, they sulked in the corner for some reason or other. Well she did. 
Then they had too much to drink as usual and suddenly it was another coincidence that we had a dark blue Peugeot. It is not even the same model. And over there, didn't that chandelier seem familiar to them and that shrub at the bottom of the garden and I don't know what else. Well, okay, but the idea that we brought Lana into the world purely because they just had a baby, tell me Albert, who would ever think that way? Alphonse, pardon me, who would ever think that way? I was in my late twenties. Everyone around us was having their first baby. Then I was four months gone before I realized she was pregnant too. But no, we were copying them. How full of yourself do you have to be to think something like that is even within the bounds of possibility? While speaking, Sieglinde and Ronnie have stood up to perform an angular dance that for Ronnie now ends with a punch, into, uh, punch to his thigh and in Sieglinde's case is still ebbing away in one index finger which taps the center of her forehead like a woodpecker's beak. Alphonse settles into the backrest of the chair when a confession starts as energetically as this, it usually lasts a while. If it had stopped there, but well, no, 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 it gets even more absurd. Sieglinde is now bending down onto the coffee table like a she-ape, weight on her fists, buttocks in the air, nostrils wide, like her eyes magnified by her glasses. Did she say anything about her pussy? Alphonse has to give the question time to sink in. It is dead, I believe. She said a bit more about it than that, I'll bet. Her story is that we kill their cat. Yes, and the reason why is even more interesting. We killed it because our own cat was run over and because they think we think they did it. We, incidentally, don't ask ourselves who was responsible. We assume it was an accident and that's why we, eye for an eye, cat for a cat, kill their pet, get this, by impaling it with a dart, a dart from a blow pipe. We shot a, bo a poisoned dart at it because that's what we are like, Alphonse. That's the kind of thing we get up to. Alphonse, says Ronnie, that's what I said. For the bedroom ceilings, he recommends, recommend, recommends balanced mood from the Colores del Mundo collection. They agree that the pale bluish green he slides out of the color swatch will do perfect. We gave a pretty good impression uh, about Belgium, I think. <laughs> we get along well. Um, so I read each of these books with such a sense of discovery um, and felt that I was not only seeing through the great fictional window into other human lives, um, but was also traveling into a geography and a culture where I was a complete foreigner. The interplay between universal concerns of love and fear and money um, and specific revelations about what life is like in Belgium, um, from the refugee crisis to the crumbling nobility to um, your style of family bickering. Um, it was all fascinating and addictive. And so I'm curious, the three of you have been touring America for the past week, uh, and my first question is very basic. Um, how different is it talking about these books in America? <laughs> She's the oldest, so she gets to <laughs> say the important stuff. Tell them you. She's wise. very wise. <laughs> it needn't be important. And in Belgium, we have so much respect for people who have much experience. <laughs> <laughs> Soon they're going to bomb me, you know. Like <laughs> <laughs> Not quite frankly, I don't think there's much uh, difference, really. I mean, like. Uh, the books dealing with um, <laughs> dysfunctional families. Unfortunately, there are dysfunctional families in the United States, I'm afraid. They're all over the world. And then, in my case, it's a dysfunctional family plus murder plus <laughs> rape. But <laughs> unfortunately, that kind of happens. You have serial killers in the, in the United States. So, I mean, quite the opposite, actually, because I, I, was, <laughs> I was telling uh, and at least just a moment ago, I said, like, there's, there's not a lot of curiosity about Belgium, sort of. I was sort of hoping, you know, because we are such a, we are really tiny. We're probably one of the tiniest countries in the world. 
And so whenever people come from the outside, it's sort of exciting, and we want to know <laughs> about what's going on in the real world, <laughs> sort of thing. So, and I was sort of expecting more of a curiosity. Now people would be curious to hear everything about Belgium because it exists, sort of thing. And so, um, no. So in fact, I don't know, have you been struck by any major difference? Because no. like a standard question like this book deals with a, a real life person and, and a standard question in Belgium and the Netherlands is, have you got to interview her? Have you talked to her? Um, this turned out to be the standard question <laughs> here in the United States as well. So that goes to prove that uh, people have similar reflexes and, and so on and so forth. Now, now Saskia is going to say something even wiser than I have been saying. So much younger. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I think that's the, the, the um, interesting thing about literature, that the more uh, particular a story gets, the more universal it becomes. And I'm always uh, surprised to, to see that happening also in my uh, own stories or, for instance, in, uh, it can be just anecdotal stuff, like in We and Me, Mika, the mother figure who is pretty obsessed or I could say neurotic um, because she doesn't have I mean she she's uh, obviously an intelligent woman but she is living under the burden of you know her she has to be a bourgeois and and so she should stay at home that's what she's been told all her life so that's what she does but she so she she obsesses about many things and she has one thing it's her uh, carpet she combs it just to, and uh, yeah, the fringes. And uh, I thought, okay, that's something I took out of my own experiences, not as the comer, but as the one seeing it happen. And I thought, okay, because people uh, tend to say in, in Belgium we're famous for our surrealism, Magritte. He uh, invented it, and so people tend to say, okay, that's what um, Belgians have. And I think some of my work has some absurdity to it or some surreal elements. So I was pretty sure uh, critics would say, okay, this combing of carpets, that's one of those typically surreal things. But um, I notice it, for instance, also in, in uh, so in Flanders, People say, oh yeah, my mother, she used to comb uh, fringes, and I see people nodding here, and also <laughs> in Germany, and it seems to be a worldwide phenomenon. <laughs> I've, I've never dared to confess this to Saskia, but I had to do it as a child. <laughs> 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 and I remember we had a special sort of semi-brush comb, you know, and it's because these fringes, they're so untidy at a certain <laughs> point, and I, I had to do this twice a week when I was reading your novel. <laughs> I, I don't remember <laughs> this, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, why don't I, at one point as a child, I just cut them off. <laughs> <laughs> Problem solved. So. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, so that's just some anecdotal stuff, but I think, on so it, it goes even more for uh, relational stuff or family things like dysfunctional families it's we're so lucky to all have dysfunctional families <laughs> but that's also something i've traveled quite a bit and basically you 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 realize like we we like to think about exotic places places which are different but when you travel a lot you find that everywhere everybody's the same people yearn for love they yearn for safety they they yearn to for, for nourishment and so on. They're happy when something good happens. They're sad when something bad happens. Uh, whether you live in Vietnam or in Sweden, I mean, and I think that's a, maybe something that literature can, that awareness can be fostered by, by literature, yeah? That we, like we maybe sometimes think like, oh, it's different for people in Syria. They're used to being bombed. No, <laughs> you know, it's uh, people aren't different. Uh, people yearn for happiness, love, shelter everywhere, all over the place. Are you going to add something? <laughs> no, <laughs> it was all true. Yeah. No. Um, uh, so, go ahead. Yeah, no, please. Well, one thing I did notice um, is that the three of your books tend to confront class in a much more um, sort of objective and realistic way than I think a lot of American novels do. Um, I don't know if it's still because we have this idea of, of this 
mythic meritocracy here that Europeans have long since um, been too wise to believe in, perhaps. Um, but for instance, uh, in The Woman Who Fed the Dogs, I think much of the vitriol directed at Odette is, um, it seems to be based on her um, sort of the relative squalor that she lives in and um, her expressiveness, her sort of lack of, of decency um, that a character like Mika would be horrified by and would judge her instinctively. Um, and similarly, Alphonse, he, he moves through the world constantly being judged by the color of his skin. And the only time he, or the, the point at the novel in which he gets a real sense of purpose is when he finds this group of Afghan refugees who are slightly further outside of the social orbit than he is. Um, so there's this very clear awareness of class distinctions in all of your novels um, that I've found to be so refreshing. And I wondered if that's something that um, Belgians are just more comfortable talking about or if you encountered a kind of political squeamishness among any of your readers. Mm. Yeah, in, in my case, uh, um, I uh, chose for, uh, well, my character is from Senegalese origin. And I think, uh, at least at first, yes, he's constantly confronted with being different. And actually, in the translations, it is put on the backside. But when, uh, well, when the book was uh, released, it was not said that he was uh, black. And people kind of found out after 40 pages, m or, or were s suspecting, and I wanted to do this so that you take place in, inside his character and then discover, oh, oh, so. I'm black in, in my mind, no, yeah, but um, but uh, I want I always wrote about outsiders, uh, and I wanted to bring, well, from physical appearance, a clear outsider in in this uh, remote community, and I also wanted to say something else about the outsider because, yes, you are always in danger when when you are the outsider, and this is not different here. But on the other hand sometimes people are also waiting for the outsider because they are very tired and afraid of each other <laughs> and they need somebody to confess to and uh, this is also his role so I don't think he just gets his pur purpose when he finds the refugees but um, no he's actually very welcomed by lots of people as a kind of psychologist although he just paints their walls and but um, I also chose uh, for, uh, he's a former musician, but he now works uh, with his hands. And I found that this is uh, not often done, actually, uh, in, in literature at least, uh, not in our countries, um, to choose somebody who is working with his hands, who is not... Uh, um, uh, what? Uh, yeah. And... Um, uh, but I needed this job uh, to get into people's houses and I I was first wondering actually when I was starting to write a book I mean would people do that would they open up even with an empathic person would they do that and then I actually met somebody who was like that and he he uh, lives in France in the Ardèche he's also from Senegalese origin actually uh, like my husband he's a, um, a friend of my husband and I w had just started the book and then we went there for a holiday and he, he actually said, yeah, I mean, I don't know what's happening to me, but since I uh, am doing this job, it's like I am the town's uh, psychologist and everybody's uh, starting uh, telling me stuff that I, yeah, I, 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 that is so intimate and so, and they cry and, and then that same evening he was called twice with, with indeed crying people who, who had to tell their story and sometimes writing a book is, is such a magical thing. Things happen that tell you you have to write this. So while I was still wondering, should I do this? Is this, I mean, a believable character? Because I had never confessed to somebody working in my house. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they do exist. <laughs> but the question was about class. And, and so you, you seem to suggest that you cannot write about class if you write a, a novel here? I think people tiptoed around it a lot more here. Um, 
we're, we're pretty good at this point about race and gender, but we still believe, uh, I think we still avoid talking about um, class because it gets into sort of larger systemic questions that our culture hasn't yet figured out solutions for. Um, and so we still think that um, narratives have upward trajectories, that there aren't these sort of um, I see, yeah. strata. So you can start at the bottom, but you have to end yeah. up in the White House or something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a little bit surprised because one of the things that strikes you when you arrive here is the number of homeless people, um, both in New Orleans and, and in New York. It's uh, highly visible. I mean, you, you can't avoid noticing it. So, um, I mean, we have them, unfortunately, in Brussels, too. Um, but one of the things as a writer, because I remember in one of the first novels I wrote, uh, there is a, a passage from the central station in Brussels to the metro station, and you, you, ha you always have the, you have the commuters in, in a hurry, and then that by the side you have the, the homeless people and the beggars. I remember using that contrast, but I mean, there must be novelists here in the United States who bring homeless people and food kitchens and so on into their work. No? Right. Yes, certainly. I think what I was struck by is the fact that all three of you dealt with it so sort of, you put it at the forefront of your books um, in a way that I found remarkable. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, but maybe you are also suggesting it has to do with the political correctness or... Yeah, and I think it may be true that Europeans suffer less from it. Mm. Or, I mean, it's it it works in different ways. Or I think there is a, a raising a rising awareness of you know we shouldn't should be very careful uh, what kind of language you use when it comes to race or class or uh, sexual orientation. Um, but yeah, for instance, uh, also in, in, in my novel, in We and Me, it's something I was really interested in because it's also uh, what is shifting in society. Mm -hmm. Like we used to have a very clear class distinction, I think, um, or people always aspire to something. But we don't have the American dream. We don't have this firm belief in uh, the sky's the limit and as long as you try hard enough, you can just make it. and. I think it's very, yeah, that's a really a difference. And we and me, those are people who have been able to achieve something. But it's also um, what I wanted to show is the impossibility of it, of how it has become uh, something we cannot do anymore. There is growth, and then you can you cannot just keep growing. It goes through the roof and then uh, something has to change. So that's what Sarah is confronted with too. Like, uh, okay, my parents actually, they have achieved more than I will ever be able to, to do, to earn, to, um, yeah, so, so what do you do next then? And that's, uh, yeah, I don't know, I think, uh, <laughs> something that's really crucial to our Western society, maybe. That we have come to a point where uh, capitalism is really um, just going crazy. And that's something that I find really uh, important to talk about. So it's, it's um, not even specifically because this is uh, about uh, bourgeois people living on a mountain in a really, you could say something like a, a gated community, people having a lot of, um, s everything's very safe, so it's, they feel very uh, unsafe. <laughs> yeah, which is, uh, that's the way it happens, because it becomes some kind of, you know, uh, the fear can be anywhere, so if you make something which has really strict uh, rules, and so for instance, also those people, they, um, just don't visit each other unannounced because that's, yeah, it's not polite. It's just no respect. Uh, they don't drink beer, they only drink wine. So those are all those unwritten rules, but they are just shared and it's very, very much is unspoken. Um, but I'm talking for 
way too long, I think, all of a sudden. <laughs> no, but uh, so, yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, so I also had a question about uh, some of your protagonists. Uh, Christine, your protagonist I would call a villain. Um, Annalise, yours is a saint. And Saskia, yours are these very complicated jumbles of being really obnoxious and also like heartbreakingly sweet. Um, but all of them are deeply compelling and I, I found myself sort of falling in love with all of them. Um, and we've had a lot of discussions, at least on this side of the ocean recently, about um, characters, particularly those written by women or who are women, being either likable or unlikable, um, sort of distilling gender into uh, people that we would want to spend time with or not want to spend time with. Um, and I'm curious about um, how you write characters that transcend that metric of likability and become something more. Yeah. Um. Well, I think uh, in most of my books, my characters are not not so sympathetic. But I was actually wondering why why shouldn't uh, literary characters be happy? I mean, why can't you pick write a story about a period in their life where they are actually quite happy? <laughs> and this is uh, the case with Alphonse. And yes, he's an empathic person, but I wouldn't say he's a saint. I mean, you get to hear some parts of, of well, some flashbacks in which he's clearly not a saint, but um, no, he's just a, a person. But um, I, I found that literature um, always had to uh, portray characters as very problematic and people are not always that problematic I think and I had uh, not a lot of examples of uh, main characters who are uh, happy and not idiots um, and I, I actually wanted to uh, portray a, a strong happy good person yeah you could say he's a good person um, but he's still a, a human being. I mean, and I, in everything that I write, I want to stay true to life. I think this is my my main aim to to stay true to life and how I see life. So I found that, um, yeah, I had to try this character, and um, uh, and I I believed in him and. Um, He's sometimes actually quite confused about what doing good is. In, I mean, it's not that clear always, or how far should you go? Uh, because sometimes when you are the only one in some stranger's life doing good, I mean, they, they claim you, of course. And uh, there are all kinds of uh, problems. And his wife actually is much more with the feet on the ground, you could say, so she's sometimes uh, Yes, restrains him a bit, and um, but yes, he's a he's a not very spectacular good person, I think. But I um, and he's happy in those thirty days of his life. Um, but I found that if you start a novel like that, there is another kind of tension slipping in, uh, and well, like half of the readers pick this up immediately, half don't, uh, because you the you think life is not that kind. I mean, even if you yourself are feeling strong and happy and doing good, uh, there's still a lot more people on this world than, <laughs> than you, and they sometimes want other things, uh, and they want to harm you. I mean, it happens. So when you start out like this with a happy, good character, uh, another kind of tension slips in and that I found very interesting as a writer. Uh, and also I found it interesting how readers reacted to it, the ones that pick it up, the ones who don't. And um, yeah, okay. Would you like me to say something? Oh yeah. Um, so when I started off writing about um, the woman who fed the dogs, I thought of her as a thoroughly evil person. And I thought of her as living on a different planet, um, planet evil, right? And that was a, the interesting thing was that while I researched her 
I found that she wasn't living on a different planet, that she was actually more or less living next door. And that in many respects, her life was incredibly ordinary. Yeah. Um, and then I, I ended up using a quote uh, out of a text by Hannah Arendt, the German philosopher, who's written about the Holocaust, saying that the perpetrators of the Holocaust were, after all, also extremely ordinary person, the banality of evil. Yeah, and that is, of course, the extremely scary thing about evil. Uh, bad people do not walk around with, with a sign on their forehead, I'm <laughs> bad, yeah? and they're also not constantly bad, you know? Uh, like, this person has been free for over uh, almost seven years now, and she's not committed any crime, she's not been a danger to anybody, so, to understand both evil and goodness, it's 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 very hard, right? So um, she certainly was not, and I hope she's not a one-dimensional character in in the book. And one of the very very weird things for me was that I, at one point, I could read letters that she had written to her mum from prison, and in one of those letters that I quote in the novel, I say, she, she wrote, I think it's dreadful for those parents to have lost their children, but those are children that she was in a position to have freed and, and, and rescued, right? And, and so you see that sometimes I have the feeling that human beings are not one, there are various persons inhabiting that one body, right? And so there is the Michel Martin who, who obviously was cruel, selfish, hysterical, all you like. But the weird thing is that when you read letters that she wrote and diary excerpts, you, s you see that she's also a caring person and, and she has three children herself and by all accounts, she's a caring, loving mother. And that is something I find extremely hard to accept and to understand and at a certain point, you, you can only say, well, this is how it is. The same person at some time does this and that. Because like in that letter it says, um, I think it's dreadful for those parents to have lost their children. That's the worst thing that can happen to a person. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm a mother too. I suffer for them. Not a day goes by that I don't think of them. And then another excerpt is, I, I have always wanted the best for everyone. Bearing in mind the words of the gospel, therefore all things whatsoever you ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so through them. Matthew seven twelve. So these could be things coming out of your novel, in fact, <laughs> for the good person. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it is indeed highly contradictory and, and, and highly complex. And one of the things readers said, uh, people who read it said that. There was so much in her they could recognize and that, th that made the reading experience quite uncomfortable. Yeah? And so I think we would like to think about evil people as completely different. And in many movies, uh, the evil character is presented. You know straight away there's an evil character because often they're not very good looking, <laughs> etc. And the music will help you. But in real life, unfortunately, that's one of the things that this has taught me. It's, um, it's, it's different. I, w I wouldn't dare to say that she's an evil person. I think she has ended up in circumstances where she became accomplice to thoroughly evil deeds. Yeah. But to say you are evil, I, I don't know. Well, there's, uh, a, there's a saying in the gospel about throwing the first stone and all that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't think, uh, or I think in, in any case, uh, novels are not a place for judgment, especially not as an author. You don't start out with, okay, this is a good character, bad character, and now we're gonna, I mean, that's not what I think is real literature, that's more pulp or something, so... Um, also in We and Me, I think it's, uh, people always try and they fail. And that's uh, what brings a lot of tragedy and also comedy into our lives. And it's something so, it's, it's the banality of goodness as well. There is something um, like, so these 
three generations, you have the circumstantial um, influence, no doubt. For instance, the uh, grandmother, she, is, she uh, suffered a lot of hardship. She lost a child, so the worst thing that could happen to you, as they say. And what she did uh, was just not talk about it. So, you know, because people, it, life goes on, and especially uh, two generations, two, three generations uh, before, people just had to survive, and that's what they did. So she uh, swallowed her grief, I think, and then her son, Stefan, he just felt as a child something was wrong, and then uh, he took on this this grief without really knowing it. And then his daughter Sarah feels, oof, there is some pain, some trauma in this family. But she thinks it's uh, genetic predisposition, like oh, we have this depression gene running through our family, and that's uh, I'm gonna. No, so I don't think you can uh, say people are good or bad, or it's just circumstances, or it's there's also uh, free will. There is. Uh, so much it can help us and, and free us also from a uh, past, but it will always play a role. And so in We and Me, I think all of the characters just try, and sometimes like Mika, she just tries too hard, and it can also be very tragic. Trying to love too much, to burden people, to smother them with love and care, and, and you know, so that's what I find really interesting. That all those paradoxes. Mm. Um, I want to open it up to questions from you guys, if you have any. I have several more that I could go on with. Um, but this is a rare opportunity to learn more about Belgian literature. Yes? Did you interview <laughs> 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 Well, there's some, some story to that, is that, um, no, I didn't, because right now uh, she's not allowed to talk to the press or to journalists and so on and so forth. But while she was in prison, at a certain point, she indicated that she wanted to write a book. And she said to her lawyer, can you get me in touch with a writer who can give me some advice on how to write a book? And he got her in touch with a French-speaking Belgian called Nicole Malancoli who then we had permission to, to, to talk to her, to visit her in prison, and ended having five conversations with her. And I didn't know about that while I was doing this book. I read it after, but it sort of tallied bit with my presentation of the, of the person. But what I regret is that when she went up to the prison to talk to uh, Michelle Martin, I call her Rodette in the novel, she's called Michelle. Um, so Michelle wanted to write a book about how hard it is for a woman, especially for a mother, to be in prison and to be separated from her children. Because when Michelle Martin was arrested, her, her youngest was, was barely nine months old, right? She had three children, and, and, and so she, she really was separated from, from her child. And, and the, the, hel the police helicopter came down in their yard and arrested them. And when you read these first letters written from prison, she didn't even know what was happening whether somebody was taking care and looking after her children. But anyway, so Nicole Mal Malancoli said, well, before you, before you talk about the hardships of being in prison, you should confront why you are in prison. So we will start by telling, yeah, you will start by telling me why you are in prison. But everybody knew why she was in prison. So, and so because she was constantly judging, I could see in the, in the book that she wrote about, she's constantly judging uh, Michel Martin and at a certain point, Michel Martin felt, I've had enough. And I think that was a missed opportunity because if she had gone along a bit, a bit with Michel Martin and said, yes, poor dear, it's very hard for you, you know, if she had tried to gain her trust, we, we might have learned something interesting. Yeah? But she was very, um, I, th I think as an interviewer, you're always uh, a bit of an opportunist, you know, you're trying to get people to tell you as much as possible, so y you are going to try and keep them on your side, you're going to be friends with them, you know. So no, no, but I do, I did, I have met, so when she was first released, she could go, one of the conditions to be released early was that she had a roof over her head, 
And that roof was provided by nuns in a convent. Because this, this one nun had been told by the Lord that, that she had to go to prison and save the soul of Michel Martin. Right? This is not fiction. I mean, maybe it's fiction. Maybe <laughs> it's fiction that God told her, but, that, but she didn't experience this as fiction. Yes? She was convinced that it was her holy duty to go to prison to rush to prison and try and save the soul of Michel Martin. And over the 16 years, uh, they became friends. And so the, 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 the nun invited Michel Martin to, to stay in the convent. And, and so when people heard that Michel Martin, this wicked woman, was going to be able to live with the nuns, yeah, people, I mean, the, the, the convent needed police protection. Yeah, pe people were furious. Uh, but then these nun, with nuns were all very, very old, and they have retired to an, an, an old nun's home <laughs> in, in Brussels, and the convent has closed down. And apparently there is a group of people who, who sort of try to protect Michel Martin from the, from the people who would lynch her, because there are people who would lynch her in the country, and they try to sort of protect her. And one of them is a, a retired judge, and he has a house, and in his house there is a sort of flat and so Michel Martin now is living in that flat. And, and my book has also been translated into French, and so he's read it. And he says, and I had a conversation with him, and, and he said, and it's very strange for me because all of a sudden then he's talking about her and about her children who come and go. And in spite of the research that I've done, for me they are still a bit abstract. And then he's talking about... Uh, Andy and Céline and Frédéric, you know, and it's, it's very strange. But all, he, he says that she does not want to read the book because she fears it's going to be full of lies. Yeah, she feels people have been telling lies about her and so on and so forth. Mm. But in, in fact, in 2028, if I'm still alive, I then can go and see her and talk to her because then she will have served her complete prison sentence. Any other questions? Yes, Susan. Yeah, yeah, and we actually do have a lot of festivals for a small language community like we have, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yes, we, we do. <laughs> but I don't think we seek one another out to read our texts, our work in progress, that we don't do. Why but do that here? I mean... They they get to see each other to read. Oh, oh well, that's yeah, I think no, that's that we don't do. We, yeah, might, we might do that actually. No, we we tend to get together to have a drink and that's and to yeah. and to gossip. <laughs> but the thing is that once you uh, are a published writer, you get invited to festivals and and then you bump into one another and you get to know. One. I I can't remember how I got to know the two of you. Uh, but we don't support each other. No, <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> we talk and we. Gossip and we yeah. no, but it's it's not like I don't um, read manuscripts from colleagues or you know I think there is a I did I did quite quite a lot of times actually, but yeah I'm I'm the saint here on the table so <laughs> you did you did what <laughs> since I'm the saint here on the table I read a lot of manuscripts actually of colleagues yeah really no, yeah, but it's, it's not like we have really a a community of writers. Mm. Of authors, no, but no. we do see each other regularly. Yeah, um, because we have a small language community. I mean, you tend to cross each other's paths mm, sort of quite often. Into yeah. one another. Yeah, I'm happy you ask actually, because translators are so often forgotten, and I think literary translators are are great. I mean, when when good, and I am. I want to mention her name. Mine is Liz Waters. And uh, she really involved me. She, uh, before this book, she uh, translated some short stories of mine and uh, a play. And um, she's she's wonderful because she. It's also the only language in which I'm translated that I uh, speak well enough, I think, to to say something about the translation. 
uh, in detail. And she invited me especially because she knows this is important to me. Uh, rhythm, I think, and musicality are very important aspects of literature. And she really invited me to, to have a close look at the rhythm, which is the hardest to keep, I think, in a translation. And then sometimes I told her, uh, well, in the English version, we can just leave this word out and the rhythm will be better. Mm -hmm. So we did stuff like that. It was a, a close cooperation and I am really thankful for her because I think she did a wonderful translation. Yeah. I noticed several points, uh, specifically in your book, Annalise, where the, the rhythm or even sort of internal rhyme was so perfect. Um, I wrote down a sentence when Alphonse is picking up his instrument. He says, it's an evening for bass, for the basics. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, what is that in Dutch? Like, how did she translate yeah, it's that? A, it's, such a, it's the same, more or less. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Uh, now I <laughs> don't know the exact, uh, yeah, for bass, for the basses, yeah, okay. I think so, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a bit confusing, but the thing is that Belgium has three official languages. Yes, and then so the in 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 Flanders, which which is in the north, w we we sort of speak Dutch, but because it's Flanders, people sort of say call it Flemish, okay, and then you cross into the Netherlands, and there they speak Dutch as well. So it's still the same languages, but increasingly you find there are differences between Dutch as spoken in. Flanders and Dutch is spoken in the Netherlands. You, uh, you can compare it, I presume, to English is spoken in England or Scotland or Ireland or the United States or New Zealand. So it's still the same language, but there are huge differences. And you can, I mean, when I, sp when I open my mouth <laughs> to speak in Amsterdam, people straight away hear that I'm, I'm from Flanders and the other way around. Yeah. Or they start speaking English too. They start <laughs> speaking English. <laughs> and there are, there are certain and it can be frustrating because there are certain expressions that are standard in Flanders and then you publish in, most publishers are in Amsterdam, which is a Dutch capital. And then there is a corrector and says, yeah, but this, this expression doesn't work. It's not correct. And we say, no, no, it is correct. That's what we say in, uh, in Belgium. It's, it's kind of, com language is extremely complicated, but it is so everywhere because there's a huge difference between the, the official language, the formal language and what people speak at home. But when you have your characters in a homely atmosphere, then of course you want them to speak like they would speak in a homely atmosphere, right? So it's, it's I find a, a very difficult issue. Like I presume for you too, if when it was set in the West Hook, people have a particular dialect there, right? Yeah. Yeah, but in this case, I immediately uh, decided, I mean, uh, it's not my dialect and mm. I am not going to write in it, of course, but mm. so, uh, no, no, this uh, this was not really a problem. But it is true that uh, for me, I I, uh, I think I don't write very different from the Dutch spoken in, in the Netherlands, but when you do um, dialogue, it's it, it can, yeah, those are the parts that sometimes you want to use something Flemish because it sounds more natural. To yeah, and there are some things that are really confusing, like uh, kleed, that's uh, in... This is a kleed in Dutch, Dutch. So, and in what you our uh, variation of the language, it's a, a dress, so can cause and some confusion. And there is one which is even more embarrassing, it's called poop, P-O-E-P. Mm. And poop in, in Flemish is, is your behind, right? So you can say sit on your poop, <laughs> whereas poop <laughs> in the Netherlands is poop, yeah. <laughs> so if you invite somebody to sit on their poop, it's a bit... But it's one of the first things Dutch people when they are in Flanders pick up, you know, they learn. Or like we also have a word for a cup, which is an, uh, a cup is a cop. Uh, no, yeah, and, but the French say une tasse, yeah. So therefore, we sort of also call this a tas, yeah? But an, an, an tas for the Dutch is, is this, yeah? We call this then a bag, a sack. So if you say to somebody, would you pour some coffee in my tas, yeah? <laughs> the, the Dutch are confused because they say, do they really want me to, to pour some coffee in the bag, you know? So, But we get along really well. Yeah, 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 we do. <laughs> but 
you sort of very quickly have to pick up certain differences, else you might run into problems. Right? And like, for instance, I find it very weird that for saying I love you, like we, we, we say in Flemish, which means I like to see you something, or I, I like seeing you. And if you say that to a Dutch person, it's like, what are you saying? Yeah? It's, it, it doesn't mean anything. Whereas you have to say, ik ben dol op jou. Eh? Or, I love you. I yeah. lo ik hou van jou, yeah. But it sounds a bit weird. So there are all these tiny differences. But uh, yeah, I find it complex and complicated and difficult when you write dialogue, whether to settle. And again, when you have a, certain, a character of a certain class, when you have a lower class character, then that character is not going to speak or use standard Dutch mm -hmm. in a certain context, in a certain environment. So I find that complicated. Well, I think learning how to say I love you in Flemish is a perfect note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> so join me in thanking our presenters. Thank you.